Well, praise the Lord, ABC. Hey. Oh. You're faithful and ever true. You're perfect in all your ways. And there is no God like you. Come on, repeat after me. Say, Oh Lord, you are my God. Oh Lord, you are my God. Faithful and ever true. Faithful and ever true. You're perfect in all your ways. And there is no God like you. There is no God like you.
There's no one like our God. Oh, 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 oh. there's no one like our God. So we lift our voices. We lift our hands to you. And we surrender in your presence, God. For you are great and greatly to be praised, yes. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope and restore every heart that is broken for great are you Lord come on let's declare it together you give life you give life you are love you are love you bring light you bring light to the dark you give hope you restore you restore every heart every heart Yes, Lord, for great are you, Lord, great are you, Lord. Come on, can y'all lift it up? Say, great are you, Lord, say, great are you, Lord. So we lift up our voice in this prayer. It's your prayer. Short 
voices and declare great, yeah. Great are you, Lord. And we worship you in spirit and in true grace. Great are you, Lord. Come on, last time. Say, great are you, Lord. Say, great are you, Lord. Father, you are great. Your name is great. Your promises for us are great. So even on today, we open up our hearts and we give you a great praise because you alone deserve it. The heavens are filled with your glory. And even the earth is filled with your glory. It's filled with your power and your presence. So God, even as we worship you, our issues and our concerns, they're cast to the side because you're so magnificent that we don't worry for anything. But God, we put our trust in you. We put our faith in you. And we just simply declare, great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. There is power in your name. There's deliverance in your name. There's healing in your great name. So, God, we give you everything that you deserve. All the glory, all the honor. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. Can somebody open your mouth and give God a great praise? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Calling all 80s and 90s babies. Listen, we have an amazing empowerment night planned just for you. Coming up soon, we have our millennial empowerment night and our theme is converse. And so we really, really, really hope you'll come into the building and just join us in conversation for something a little bit different than just regular church as normal. It'll definitely be different because the language of millennials is dialogue. Right. So our goal in this experience is to curate a space where you can feel safe to dialogue about spiritual things. We can worship the Lord together and enjoy some time of hanging out. So join us October 26th at EBC Atlanta at 7 p.m. live and virtual. See Mark you soon. your calendars, we gotta see you there. Happy Voter Registration Sunday. My name is Lisa Baker and I am here to share some very important election information with you. EBC has partnered with FaithWorks, a voter education and mobilization initiative whose mission it is to equip empower and encourage members of our congregations to get prepared to participate in the November elections. So I have a few dates to keep in mind as you make your plan to go and vote. The voter registration deadline is October the 11th. Now is the time to get registered to vote or to check your registration. And for those who are registered, please be sure to check that your registration is accurate before the October 11th deadline. Second, now is the time to request your absentee ballot for those who choose the mail-in option to cast their vote. And remember, when requesting your absentee ballot, please include a copy of your ID. Lastly, the first day to vote early in person is Monday, October 17th. The last day to vote in person is Election Day, November the 8th. These dates and other election information can be found on the FaithWorks website at faithworks.vote. EBC, let's get engaged. Let's encourage others to get engaged and let's go vote. All roads lead to Atlanta, Georgia. The Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship International presents Propel 2022 with Presiding Bishop Joseph W. Walker III, Founder Bishop Paul S. Morton Sr., and our conference host, Bishop Craig L. Oliver Sr. Meet us in Atlanta, Georgia, October 18th through the 20th at Elizabeth Baptist Church for Propel 2022. It's our first hybrid Propel experience since the pandemic, and we are 
back with acclaimed speakers on mission to fortify leaders for formidable times. General session speakers include Bishop Kevin and Dr. Linda Willis, Bishop Lisa Wea, Bishop Johnny Withers, Dr. Tillis Chapman, Pastor Lance Watson, Pastor Reginald Sharp, Dr. Darius Daniels, Pastor Angelic Simmons, Dr. E. Dewey Smith Jr., and our conference host, Bishop Craig L. Oliver Sr. New to Propel this year is our take on TED Talks, entitled Propel Talks, featuring Pastor Diamond Gant, Dr. Dara Hall, Master Sergeant Cedric King, Bishop Brian and Pastor Deborah Pierce, Bishop C. Guy Robinson, Dr. John Faison, Miss Tara Jackson, and Dr. J. Elvin Sadler. Go today to fullgospelconference.org to register and secure enhancements for your overall Propel experience. Propel 2022, October 18th through the 20th in Atlanta, Georgia. You don't want to miss this. Register today at fullgospelconference.org. EBC family and friends, I'm excited about October the 9th. You're asking why? It's going to be a big reveal. You don't want to miss it. Whether online or in service, you don't want to miss October the 9th for the big reveal. As I'm going to share with you how our church is making an impact for God's kingdom and his glory as we seek to improve even our community. You don't want to miss it online or in service. The big reveal, October the 9th. It's family time. Communion together. Worship together. Celebration together. Let's do it together. 6 p.m. Sunday, October 2nd, 2022 at EBC Atlanta. Yes, EBC Atlanta, Conyers, Douglasville, Fairburn, and Smyrna all together at our Atlanta campus for an evening of honor, history, redress, and rejoicing. As we relive and experience our pastor, Dr. Craig L. Oliver Sr.'s elevation to the office of bishop in the Lord's Church. With family, friends, and special guests, including presiding bishop of the Full Gospel Baptist Church Fellowship, Joseph W. Walker, founder and bishop, Paul S. Morton, Bishop Jerry Hutchins, and more. Let's do it together, Sunday, October 2nd at 6 p.m., at EBC Atlanta. All right, EBC, I'm excited. I hope you're excited. Yes, we give God glory for this is the day that the Lord has made. And this is the day we get to celebrate him. We get to celebrate God and the man of God that he has given to us. I hope you will come offline and come into the sanctuary. I'm excited about those of you who are in the sanctuary. Please come back tonight, tonight at six o'clock and join all of our campuses and all of our services in the house as we celebrate the man of God. So I've been reflecting and praying and leading up to this time. And one of the things God has showed me this morning and I shared it with our beloved pastor is, you know, we're, we're, we're doing a Bible study called the heart of God. And God has shown us the significance in the temple and in the garments and then the stones, it's all relevant to God. And so I'm excited that we get to see our man of God get dressed and God elevate us as a people of God to do the work of God. So don't miss out. Tonight it goes down as we see him as he is bishop and clothed in the garments that got him. Woo, I don't know about you, but I'd come. I hope to see you all at six. And the last thing is, I'm looking forward to the fellowship of all the believers of God, of EBC, ABC, Conyers, Douglasville, in the house. I'm excited. Join us here tonight. Well, come on, this is a day that the Lord has made and you and I shall rejoice and be glad in it from the rising of the sun to the setting of the same. His name is worthy to be praised. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Come on, one last time, give God the best praise you can. Come on, thank our God. We bless his name on today and to each and every one of you that join us here on campus, we honor God for your presence 
And to you, my friend, who join us online, wherever you are, whoever you are, we give God praise that you would take time on this day to be a part of this communal space of worship as we've come together to worship our God and as we've come together as the people of God to share in fellowship and to share in the presence of God on this day. And again, we bring you greetings and we welcome each and every one of you. Again, as you have heard the video announcements, please stay mindful of your responsibility to go out and to vote. Please, of course, recognize that many individuals have made the supreme sacrifice of even their life, have given their blood, sweat, and tears so that you and I can exercise our responsibility to go out and to vote. And we recognize that we're living in an age where people are trying to turn back the hand of time and take us back to an era that we fought to be removed from. And so we wanna do our parts, part. We wanna go out and vote. As well, brothers and sisters, many of you are fully aware of what has just recently happened uh, in my beloved state of Florida as it relates to those who've been devastated by way of the uh, storm. And many lives, unfortunately, has been lost and billions of dollars as it relates to the damage to properties have taken place. And so our desire here at EBC, as is our constant response whenever there's an issue or even beyond that, a natural disaster as such, of course, we want to engage our Operation Uplift, our Operation Uplift. And I'm going to ask of all of our members that can and will to give a sacrificial offering of at least $20, if you can, above and beyond your regular tithes and offerings. And all that you would give towards Operation Uplift would be designated to support those individuals there in the various impacted cities as a result of Hurricane uh, in that has taken place. And so again, I want to encourage you to give. And here is how we go about the whole process. As you give to Operation Uplift, we identify a local church and pastor in the various communities to which we partner with to be a blessing to them. And often, of course, our goal is to partner with a church that is oftentimes our communities that are oftentimes overlooked. Even when FEMA shows up and other organizations and agencies show up, they have the tendency of sometime missing our community or making it even challenging for our community. So we identify a local church and pastor uh, that we partner with to be of support uh, to that ministry and to the people within that community. So whatever you give, 100% of your offerings and your contributions to Operation Uplift will be designated towards helping those who've been impacted by way of the storm. Amen? Again, EBC, I can't thank you enough for your spontaneous generosity, even as it relates not just to Operation Uplifts over the years, but even as it relates to our Operation Jackson, Mississippi, as we have given, of course, over two trailer loads of water, and we have yet another entire semi-truck that's going back down to Jackson, Mississippi to, to drop off again a load of water. And again, I want to thank you so much for your spontaneous generosity. Give yourselves another wonderful hand for your willingness to give. And so we thank you so much for such. And again, as you have stated, it would really just warm my heart if you would be a part of tonight's uh, service. I'm looking forward to my pastor, and I say that with joy and presiding Bishop, Bishop Joseph Walker, who would be with us this evening. And I'm looking forward to all of us coming together uh, in this place, in this space here at our Atlanta location. If for whatever reason you're unable to do so and you're somewhere else throughout the whole span of this world, join us online. We want you to be a part. But if you're able to be here physically, we certainly would encourage you to do so. And we're looking forward to a grand time as we celebrate as a people of faith. At this time, brothers and sisters, we're also now preparing our hands and hearts to worship God by way of giving. What a joy it is to give. What an honor it is to give. Oh, come on, you can show more enthusiasm than that. What a joy it is to give. What an honor it is to give. And as even scripture says, it is more blessed to do what, church? Than it is to do what? And so we thank God that God has positioned us to be givers and we're able to give. And as we give today, we recognize that all things come of thee, O God, and it is of thine own that we give. David is clear that he recognized the source behind all of his blessings. All things come of thee, O God. And God has positioned us to be stewards, to be managers of those resources that God has given unto us. And as we give today, we give in honor unto God. We give in obedience unto God. We give as an act of faith. We give as an act of Christian stewardship. We recognize that in which we receive has come again from God. And we're managers, we're stewards 
of those resources. And here at Elizabeth, we do believe in the biblical principle and practice of tithing. That we do believe that we give unto God a tenth part of our income and increase as God has so blessed us. And so I would encourage you, even as you give today, to give your tithe. How many can testify that you can't beat God in giving? And we recognize again the principle of tithe that even as we honor God in the giving of our tithe, that God will open up the windows of heaven and he will pour us out blessings to the degree that you and I would not even have the capacity to receive them all. And oftentimes the blessings that God give are blessings that money cannot even buy. And we thank God for the blessings of God. Now there's a myriad of ways whereby you're able to give here at EBC, of course. We ask that you would consider giving our preferred way, which is to set up your account to become a reoccurring giver as you would go to the church website to elizabethbaptist.org backslash giving, and you can set up your account to become a reoccurring giver. That is the process that I utilize, and many of you as well have utilized that process. And I would encourage you, if you have not signed up, to do so. You can also give by way of text giving, and information is being shared with you as it relates to that particular format and platform of giving. Also, to you who are watching online and to you as well on campus, you can scan the QR code and it would lead you through the whole process whereby you're able to give utilizing that particular platform. And you can mail in your tithe gifts and offerings to 4245 Cascade Road, Southwest Atlanta, Georgia, 30331. And again, as you will leave out of the auditorium today, doorkeepers will be standing at the various doors prepared to receive your gifts as you will place them within the receptacles. However you opt to give, we thank you in advance for your generosity. We thank you for not just your generosity, but for your unhindered generosity as you give even on today. Let's pray. God, how we honor you and how we thank you and how we bless you for the privilege that is ours as we come now to give. Father, we pray that you would sanctify each and every seed that will be sown, multiply that it might be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom and the advancing of your calls. We give your name praise and we give your name glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray in, and all those that agree with this prayer in one united voice said, amen, amen. Our music ministry is gonna come as we're preparing to transition into this moment of communion. And as we prepare to transition into this moment of communion, I would encourage you to center your heart upon Christ and his cross. This is the time not to engage in idle conversation. This is not the time to serve on your phone, but rather this is a time that we center our hearts. We make ready to receive the Lord's Supper. Our praise will just lead us and I will come forward and preside. So what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus And what can make me whole again Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow Found I know nothing but the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the blood. And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. Of Jesus, and what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. They really could have continued singing. I wanted to at least try to sing with the praise team, <laughs> but we appreciate them. At this time, brothers and sisters, we're preparing for the Lord's Supper. It's a very important part as it relates to our worship experience in that it is a time in which we do at least three things. It's a time where in number one, we remember the Savior. Do this, says Christ, in remembrance of me. 
What do we remember about the Savior? We remember, of course, and reflect upon his righteousness, that in and through his sacrifice, death, burial, and resurrection, and our faith in the atoning work of Jesus Christ, we're saved as a result of such. So we partake in the Lord's Supper as we remember the Savior. Let the church say, remember the Savior. Not only do we share in the Lord's Supper as we remember the Savior, but second of all, we also repent of our sins. Let the church say, repent of our sins. Paul is emphatically clear that all have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. We have fallen short of the glory of God, but we have not fallen short of the grace of God. Scripture declares that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We not only remember the Savior, we not only repent of our sins, but we also, third of all, we rejoice in our salvation. Let the church say rejoice in our salvation. We rejoice over the fact that God has saved us. We rejoice over the fact that our names have been written in the Lamb Book of Life. We rejoice that we have peace with God and no more enmity. We rejoice because we've been reconciled with God and we have the ministry of reconciliation. We rejoice because the blood of Jesus Christ has given us forgiveness. The blood of Jesus Christ has counseled our sins past, present, and future. We rejoice because we will one day spend eternity with God in heaven. Come on, would you rejoice right now? We remember the Savior. We repent of our sins. Why do we share in communion? We rejoice over our salvation. But then we also share in the Lord's Supper so that we can go retell the story. That when we leave this place, we go to the highways and the byways. We go to the hilltops and to the valleys. And we tell men and women that we have a Savior that can save from the uttermost to the guttermost. We go and retell the story. Retell what story? Tell the story about how Jesus saved you. Tell the story about how Jesus delivered you. Tell the story how he brought you out of darkness and led you into the marvelous light. Tell the story of how he made you a child of God, a son of the Most High. And so we share in the Lord's Supper today. We remember the Savior. We repent of our sins. We rejoice in our salvation. And we make the commitment to go retell the story. Would you take even now the unleavened bread as you would hold it within your hands? Jesus and his disciples had gathered in that upper room for the observation of Passover, to which in that context he institutionalized what we celebrate today being that of the Lord's Supper. He took the unleavened bread, he broke it and he blessed it and he passed it among his disciples. And that bread in which they held within their hands represented his body that would soon be a fist nailed to the cross as he would die for their sins and the sins of the world. And so in the spirit of that day, as he would take the wafer on the substitute thereof, would you repeat after me, as I shall eat this broken wafer, I am reminded of the blood of Jesus Christ, of the body of Jesus Christ, excuse me, that was nailed to the cross for my sins. Let us even be thankful. Again in the spirit of that day, will you repeat after me, as I shall drink the fruit of the vine, I am reminded of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for my sins. Let us drink and be thankful. Well, beloved, after they had shared in the Lord's Supper, they departed from that place rejoicing and singing a hymn. And I believe even right now is a good time for us to rejoice. Even right now is a good time for us to give God praise. Come on, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, who has been redeemed from the hands of, I said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, who has been redeemed from the hands of the enemy.
God praise. God will pray for God will pray for for your blood. For it reaches the highest mountain. And it flows to the lowest valley. God will pray for. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, continue to give God praise and glory in this place. To God be all praise and to God be all of the glory. Well, family, I'm absolutely excited today as it relates to our preacher that's going to share with us, a son of this house, a son in the faith, in the person of Dr. Daryl Hall, who's our campus pastor at the Congress location. So excited to have him to share with us today. And on this particular day, I decided to take this Sunday off and to be fed as the word of God is being presented. And so I've asked of him to come ho over from the Kanye's location here to the Atlanta location to share with us at this particular service as he would go back to the Kanye's location in order to facilitate service there. And so EBC, let's welcome our son of the faith, son of our house, Dr. Darrell Hall, as he shall come. Come on, how many people are excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Has God been good to anybody besides me? Listen, that's cute for me, but let's put our hands together for a good God who's been merciful to us, who's been gracious to us. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. I greet you this morning in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm delighted to step in today for our pastor, the Reverend, the doctor who's been elevated to the office of bishop, Craig Oliver Sr. Can we thank God for our man of God today? Come on, let's salute him. Hallelujah. Uh, when I got the note that I was to stand in today, uh, it was early for me, but I love my pastor and I love my church. And any chance I get to step in to, uh, to give him some reprieve, I'm glad to do so. And so let's thank God for him as he rests, as he's fed today. Amen. I tell you, the one who does a lot to make sure everybody eats from time to time needs to sit down and eat as well. The biblical principle is this. Don't muzzle the ox who treads out the corn. And that has so many implications uh, to take care of the practical needs of the pastor, but also the spiritual needs of the pastor. So we pray today that his heart is filled uh, with God's grace and God's love as I and others support. If you have your word, would you grab it please and join me in the book of Exodus. Exodus is where we're going to be. I'm going to continue the series we've been in entitled Up Close and Personal and I'm delighted to share today a message that would continue that train of thought. Exodus chapter 12 is where we're going to be and I think it's providential that we land in Exodus 12 on the very day we commemorate Holy Communion. I mean, what are the chances that we will be preaching all the way to this day? And then on this day, first Sunday, is we're going to celebrate not just communion together a few minutes ago, but later tonight. Exodus 12 is where we are. I'm going to read verse 21 through verse number 28, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. The word of the Lord says, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Pick out and take lambs for yourself according to your families and kill the Passover lamb and you shall take a bunch of hyssop dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts the Lord will pass over. Everybody say Passover. <laughs> Notice he's going to pass through the Egyptians. He's going to pass over those who are covered by blood. The Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to strike you. Verse 24, and you shall observe this thing as an ordinance for you and your sons forever. It will come to pass when you come to the land which the Lord will give you, just as he promised, that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? That you shall say, 
It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our households. So the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the children of Israel went away and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of our God as we continue our series entitled Up Close and Personal. Looking at the life and leadership of Moses, I want to add this installment, very simply, a meal of remembrance. A meal of, of remembrance. Let's pray together. And Father, we thank you for this sacred space that we occupy together. For those who are in person and those who are joining virtually. We're grateful to be glued together by your spirit, that it is you who is at work in us and through us. It is you who binds us in the spirit of unity and the bond of peace. And we're grateful for this table where all your daughters and sons can come together to feast with you, to sup with you, and to commune with one another. We pray now as we turn our attention to your word that you will open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your law. Would you help us to appreciate and understand the beauty of the feast and the meal of remembrance. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say, amen. A meal of remembrance. I'm sure we can think back to some pivotal times in our lives, uh, negatively and positively, where at a table, we'll never forget the conversation that took place. For some of us, our hearts were broken at a table over a meal as things were revealed that we were not aware of. But for others of us, we can think back to happy times where meals punctuated or accentuated some of the best days of our lives. Perhaps it was a wedding that was followed by a meal at a party. Maybe it was a birthday or a milestone for you where folk surprised you and gathered together for a meal to commemorate your birthday. Maybe it was a graduation or a promotion or a holiday that's your favorite time of year because you get together with people you mostly love and usually like. <laughs> to eat food you enjoy. Food is powerful, isn't it? And I think God in his infinite wisdom knew that when he created us to be communal, interconnected by design, that meals were hardwired into the fabric of human tapestry so that over food we could bond together with him and with one another. Food is so powerful that sitting in a room at 8 o'clock in the morning, if I just start mentioning some of your favorite food, <laughs> you will leave me in this place to preach to myself. <laughs> I ain't even named the food yet, but you already start thinking of some of your favorite dishes. Mouth is watering. Heart is palpitating. Mind is roaming because food is powerful. And so it's no wonder then here in Exodus chapter 12 that God would institute a meal to stamp this annual ceremony for his people to remember the phenomenon of this 10th plague in Egypt. On last Sunday in one sermon, we covered nine plagues. If you missed it, I commend to you my brother Simon Reverend Terrence Albritton who stood in this very place and walked us from Exodus chapter 7 verse 5 up until where we are now. What we discover through the first nine plagues are these simple truths by way of quick review that God speaks to those who listen to him. God strives with those who lie to him and God spares those who love him. Whew. And doesn't God show us that in this 10th and final plague? His capacity, his, his dexterity of holiness to simultaneously correct some and cover others. I don't know how God does it, but I know that God does it. And Exodus chapter 12 gives us this real story of what took place in Egypt all these years ago that we just commemorated the new covenant version of called Holy Communion. 
There's one central idea from this text that is simple but yet powerful, and that is this. The annual Passover feast reminded Israel of the power of God. That as they instituted this feast and once a year as they celebrated this feast, it was intentional to remind them of the power of God. So when we look at the story, I want us to ask a handful of questions. And if we ask the right questions, I believe the text will give us clear answers so that by the time we leave, we'll understand more about this meal of remembrance. Here's the first question, and that is this. What are the ingredients of the meal? Everybody say ingredients. What are the ingredients of the meal? From verse 5 down to verse number 11, we see that the first ingredient was a lamb. A lamb was a part of this meal. This lamb was fundamental for the feast to take place because without this lamb, the Passover event wouldn't have happened. And so they institute this holiday and this holy day by the slaying of a lamb. Look at verse number five. It says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Do you see that in verse number five? If you read it too quick, you'll miss that this lamb couldn't just be any old lamb. That there were divine specifications on the attributes of this lamb so that it could meet holy standards. What you mean, Reverend? It had to be a lamb without blemish, which is to say a pure coat, no streaks, no spots. It had to be a male lamb that's very specific. A young lamb, one years old or less, and it had to come from among the flock. Which means you couldn't get a lamb that was speckled or spotted, or you couldn't get a female lamb, or you couldn't get an older lamb, or you couldn't go get a lamb from another flock from another country. It's got to be without blemish. Why? Because that blemish is a symbol of sin. And God wanted this lamb who was going to die to be pure. It had to be a male lamb so that it could be representative of those who would be covered by it. It had to be young because it was precious and innocent and without sin. And it had to be from among the flock because God would call one from among us to die for us. All these factors are critical because they were qualifiers for the blood of that lamb to meet God's standard. So the people would slay this lamb and they would take that blood and they would cover their doorposts with it. Can't you hear John the Baptist hopping in on the Zoom call with me, you, and Moses saying, that's why in chapter 1, verse 29, when I saw my cousin walking along the side, I said, behold the Lamb of God. Whew. One without spot, one without street, one who is sinless. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not only a lamb, but also a loaf. <laughs> There's a loaf. The ingredients of this meal are two, lamb and loaf. Verse number 15 tells us about this loaf. It says that for seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Verse 8 tells us to eat unleavened bread. Verse 19 through verse number 20 says for seven days no leaven shouldn't even be in your houses. It wasn't just any old loaf. It was an unleavened loaf. Now, this term leaven means yeast. And it is an agent that you put in the dough that enables the dough through the process of baking to rise in the heat. I don't know this because I can cook. I know this because I studied the priest. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't know what to do with some yeast if you put it right in front of me. <laughs> but I do know unleavened means without yeast. Without yeast. It's not just the agent that causes the dough to rise when heat is applied. What's interesting about leaven is it only takes a little bit to leaven the whole loaf. So when God says, eat your bread without yeast, and for seven days, I don't even want no yeast in your houses, here's what he's saying. Be careful that a little bit can have a lot of impact. That's why Galatians chapter 5, verse number 9, says that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Yeah. You mean leaven, Reverend? What is God getting at? He's getting at sin's subtle influence. 
that for those of us who prioritize godly things in our lifestyle, all it takes is a little bit of sin whew, to cause a lot of trouble. And we all got enough headaches and heartaches to agree with a hearty amen. It only takes a little bit. So God says, I don't even want a little bit around you because a little bit can permeate the dough of what I'm doing in your soul and draw you away from me. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 11 through 12, he says, how is it that you don't understand that I'm not speaking to you about bread? But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. That they understood then that he was not to tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine, the teaching of Pharisees and Sadducees. I know and I appreciate that we have access to so many ideologies, so many teachings and teachers. But I commend to you the same admonishment Jesus gave his disciples in Matthew chapter 16. I commend to you today, beware of the teaching you allow to enter your heart and your mind. Because all it takes is a little to influence what God is doing in your life. The first question we ask is, what are the ingredients of this meal? We notice, number one, there's a lamb. Number two, there's a loaf. Number two, here's the second question. What are the impacts of this meal? Because they weren't just to come together for some bread and some meat and good God, let's eat and be done. <laughs> this meal was to have an impact on those who would gather. And what I want us to see when we look at this text is how this meal was a, a glue, so to speak, in the, in the life and in the rhythm of the culture of these people. This meal has several impacts. Here's the first impact. It would bring together the old and the young. It would bring together the old and the young. And I say that now because today I am as young as I'll ever be and as old as I've ever been. <laughs> I say that with all due respect because I have been young, but I look forward to being old because the only thing better than being young is being old. But this meal would bring together the old and the young. It was an intergenerational celebration that was supposed to be kept in every generation and led by the elders. All right, I'm in verse number 21. Look at what it says. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel. Do you see that? He said to them, y'all go pick out the ingredients for you and your families. All right, jump down to verse 24. And you shall observe this thing as an ordinance with you and your what, church? Sons. What? Do you see that? The old and the young were to be brought together over this meal. Moses is speaking to the elders about this. Now, when we mention elders, we're talking about those who are of age, who are seasoned by life. And scripture is clear to us that if, we, if we're blessed to have elders in our biological family and obviously also in our spiritual family, how we ought to respond to them. Leviticus 19, verse 32, in this same law, these first five books, it says, you shall rise before the gray-headed and honor the presence of an elder. Fear your God, I am the Lord. Is it possible? that American families have been harmed in part because of the lack of elders at our table. And if the elders are present, is it possible that the American family has been broken because of the lack of honor for elders at our table? That's another sermon for another day. What this text is drawing us to though is this truth, that all generations were to be brought together under the same roof for this meal. Exodus chapter 12, verse 26, it says, and it shall be when your children say to you, why do we keep doing this every year? What's the purpose of this? I thought it was just my kids who asked too many questions. <laughs> Apparently it's biblical. Kids are gonna ask questions. So God says, I want you to have this meal and I want it to bring together the old and the young. Why? Because the young are naturally inquisitive and when they sit down to eat the lamb and the loaf, they're going to ask you to teach them a lesson. Why do we do this? 
So you answer them and you explain the story. Now, this story is a harrowing one because the firstborn of every person and animal in Egypt is going to die if they're not covered by the blood. And though it may be possible for us to understand it mentally, for some it may be tough to, uh, to accept in our gut. Why would God do this? What seems like on the surface as a divine God picking on an ethnicity, if you dig deeper into the text, you will discover that it is the one true God categorically defeating the false gods of these people. Because these people were polytheistic. So with each plague, God levied a categorical defeat over every God they served until they recognized who was the one true God. And it just so happens they got a narcissist on the throne who fancies himself a God, and so he refuses to bow the knee to Jehovah. Who, who is Yahweh that I should listen to him? Don't he know who I am? I'm, I'm, I'm a God too. I'm the son of Ra. God was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> back, back. Let me show you something. So what seems on the surface like a divine being picking on an ethnicity is not so. It is a divine being giving instructions and those who fear him adhere and are spared. But those who ignore him are not. And so he says, look, when you have this meal, bring everybody into your house. Everybody say house. The old and the young, bring them into your house. Here's why. Because whoever is in the house, whew, that's who I'm going to pass over, whoever's in the house. Old or young, are they in the house? <laughs> Question, how many people, how many generations are in your family but not in the house? How many cousins you got who have the blood of your grandparents but not covered by the blood of your Savior? But Rev, you don't know my cousins. Like I do, I don't even like my cousins, real. You might like them a little bit more if they were in the house. Not just biologically, think about it spiritually. Who's missing from this house? Whoever is in the house will be covered, regardless of generation, old or young. Because this meal was to bring together the old and the young, but then B, I really like this one. Whew. This meal was a bridge between the past and the future. Woo. This meal wouldn't just bring together the old and the young. This meal was a bridge between the past and the future. I'm in verse number 17. He says, so you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this same day, I will have brought out your armies. Do you see that? <laughs> He says, I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generation as an everlasting ordinance. What's going on? God says, the first meal you have, you're going to have in anticipation of what I'm about to do. <laughs> then, every year after that, you're going to have that same meal in reflection of what I have done. Meaning, you're going to celebrate today in advance for a deliverance that ain't even happened yet. And once I deliver you, you're going to keep on celebrating when you look back on how good I am. It is a prospective meal and a retrospective meal. Why? Because wherever you are in your life, this meal can remind you that the God who was faithful in my past is the God who's going to be good in my future. Is there anybody on a bridge between yesterday and tomorrow who can testify, God, I thank you for your grace that you saved me and kept me and watched over me. And what you did yesterday lets me know what you're going to do tomorrow. That's why I don't have to wait till Monday to give you praise. I can bless you on Sunday for what you had not even done yet on Monday. Is there anybody who can open your mouth and put your hands together for the fact that God will show up in your future? He says, eat it now, I'll act later. Praise me now, I'll move later. Trust me, today I'll bless you later. Obey me right now, I'll favor you tomorrow. Is there anybody on a bridge? A bridge between yesterday and tomorrow. This meal bridges the past and the future. 
No matter when you take this meal, you're always on a bridge between your past and your future. <laughs> okay, Rev, what you're talking about? This meal is the Old Testament precedent for Holy Communion, what we just celebrated a few minutes ago. And it, it's the same meal under different covenants. So when we look at Holy Communion, notice how Holy Communion bridges the past and the future. The past is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. The future is Jesus' return. That's why he said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death until I come. Jesus, in the past, I died for you. In the future, I'm coming back to get you. So every time you eat this, you bridge the past and the future. <laughs> what about my personal past, Reverend? In my past, there's a secret life of iniquity, but in my future, there's an examined life of accountability. That's why 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight 28 says, but let a man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. What do you mean, Reverend? Whenever I take this meal, I'm always somewhere on the bridge between who I was and who I'm becoming. Let me live a more examined life. What you mean, past and future? In the past, there were my sins, what I did. In the future, it is my salvation, who I'll be. That's why Paul said, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, old things have passed away and all things have become new. Don't you know every time you take this meal, you are renewed again? Is there anybody grateful for the spiritual phenomenon that helps you to reflect on the fact that you've been saved and you're being saved and you will be saved? Anybody grateful for some grace that'll cover your yesterday and open a door for your tomorrow? This meal brings together the old and the young. It bridges the past and the future. See, it binds the great and small. It binds the great and small. Think about how many ways society subdivides us. The rich and the poor. Republicans and Democrats. Black and white. Ugly and cute. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> Society subdivides us in so many ways, and I appreciate the complexity of diversity because God created us to be unified, not uniform. However, at this table, whew, what would divide you in society can join you together spiritually. Because <laughs> at this table, I don't come to this table as rich or poor. I don't come to this table as elephant or donkey. I don't come to this table as white or black. I come to this table as a daughter of the divine and a son of the sovereign. And his table is illimitable, which means for all time and for all people, if you come by faith, you can pull up a chair and eat. Is there anybody grateful for the fact that this table binds us? Small and great. I'm in the text, I'm in Exodus chapter 12, verse number four. He says, and if a household is too small, let them and a neighbor next to them come together and share the lamb. What are they saying? A big house can have its own lamb. But what about a little house? Well, a little house would partner with another little house to share a lamb. And what's amazing is whether you were in a big family that had its own lamb, or a small family that needed a potluck to help share the lamb, whether you were small or great, everybody at the same time was eating the same meal and being saved by the same mercy. <laughs> Because it's not how much you make, it's not how much you know, it's not how much you have, it's not what zip code you live in, it's not who you know or what you drive or what you wear. We all eat the same meal because we need the same mercy. Is there anybody who can testify, Reverend, you telling the truth? I need mercy in my life to plead my case. It binds us together, small and great, it bridges us between the past and the future, and it brings together the old and the young. Here's the third thing, and I'll be done, not just the ingredients of the meal, lamb and loaf, not just the impact of the meal, 
But number three, here are the implications of the meal. The implications of this meal, meaning what are we to do spiritually as we partake of this meal? Because it would be futile to just eat it if it doesn't have any implications on your spirituality. Now, here's what's amazing. I don't know if this is uh, just years and years and years of being influenced by Dr. Oliver's teacher, but the sermon that he just gave as we took communion is exactly, mostly what I have here as the implications of the meal. What are the implications of the meal? A, to reflect on your Savior. <laughs> oh, reflect on your struggle. I'm sorry, the last one is remember the Savior. I'll get to it. Reflect on our struggle. What you mean our struggle? Verse number one, if you read it to a fast, you'll read right past it. It says, now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, where church? In the land of Egypt. Oh, what a mighty God we serve that we could be in the very place of struggle, but he will speak to us. Notice where they are. They are in Egypt. And they had been here now for 400 years. This was a place of struggle. This Pharaoh had treated them harshly and burdened them with impossible tasks. He had worked them relentlessly. So this meal was to cause them to reflect on this struggle. But I like chapter 12, verse 11, it says, and thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, sandals on your feet, a staff in your hand, and eat it real fast because it's the Lord's Passover. <laughs> What's going on here? This is not a meal to recline. This is not a meal to, of exquisite taste. Mm -mm. <laughs> get your bread, get your meat. But before you eat it, get fully dressed. Here's why. Because this is a meal for movers who are about to be blessed by a move of God. So be ready to run as soon as you eat. Because after God does what God is about to do, he's going to deliver you from your struggle and you ain't going to have time to get ready after deliverance has happened. You got to be ready to run now. We're waiting on the hand of God. We're waiting on the move of God. We eat it in haste. Why? Because we are paying attention not to our stomachs, but we're paying attention for our salvation. And when we hear the move of God in our vicinity, we're ready to move. When I move, you move just like that. Is there anybody who can testify? God, help me to be focused on how you're moving in my life. You don't have to have lived in Egypt to appreciate this, though, do you? <laughs> I've never lived in Egypt, but I have lived in sin. <laughs> and I know something about God delivering you from some sin. And if you've ever been delivered from a sinful struggle, you know that once I ran out and survived by the hair on my chinny chin chin and God has delivered me with his outstretched arm I'm not going back for nobody and nothing you pull me out so I'm going to stay out is there anybody who's taken up your bed and walked off of some ways that God has healed you some sins that God has redeemed you from is there any movers who God has moved for you ought to be thankful for the fact that this is a meal for movers I can't stay here long. I got to run on and see what the end's going to be. This meal was for us to reflect on our struggle. This meal was also be for us to realize we were spared. <laughs> Whenever you take this meal, it should cause you to pause, to think back to what used to be your reality. <laughs> and what is your reality? And what was the differentiating factor between what used to be my reality and what is? Okay, verse number 13, he says, I will pass over you. Whew. When the death angel comes through Egypt, he is bringing judgment. Everybody in Egypt will be judged. Save those who by the display of blood over their door have already been judged or the lamb has been judged on their behalf. 
So what he's saying is, look, it's not like death one in your neighborhood. <laughs> it's not like consequences weren't coming. It's not like God wasn't going to call you to the carpet about where you were and what you were doing. It's just by the time God showed up with consequences, he saw something over your life that made him skip over you. <laughs> it ain't that you weren't in Egypt because you was in Egypt. It's just when God showed up to correct those who were out of pocket, you were covered by something that died on your behalf. And because you were covered by something that died on your behalf, you get to live. <laughs> so when we eat this meal, here's what we got to remember. I used to have an address in Egypt too. I lived on the same street with folk who died. I grew up right next to folk who the judgment caught. I was right there with them and they got consequences I didn't get. So every time I take this meal, I take this meal and it brings humility to my soul. Not because I've been cute, careful or considerate. Not because I've never lived in Egypt, but because of the blood of the lamb over my life, I have been spared. I've been spared. Here's the last thing and I'll be done. We do it, see, to remember our Savior. There it is. Remember our Savior. Remember that lamb? <laughs> Who does it really describe? Remember that loaf? Who does it really describe? It's really a foretaste of Jesus. That's why he's called the Lamb of God. Mary had a little... <laughs> Lamb. Verse number 14, it says, and so you sh this shall be a memorial to you. What is a memorial? A memorial is when you set an annual reminder of something that if you don't set this reminder, you might make a mistake and forget it. But it's so important to remember that you set a date to make sure you never forget it. It is a memorial. What is God saying? He's saying, look, when I bring you into your promised land, don't forget my Passover. <laughs> when I take you to where you're going, don't forget where I brought you from. <laughs> when I raise you up for them to see, don't forget where I pulled you up from before they saw. <laughs> when the lights come on in your life, don't forget I showed up for you in the darkness. I'm done, church. We do this to remember our Savior. For Jesus is the Lamb, without spot or wrinkle. Jesus is the Lamb, who is representative. Jesus is the Lamb, who was precious and sinless. Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Listen, I know we do things from time to time that we hope we don't lose a sense of awe about. And I think it's important that we have moments like this where we commemorate Holy Communion. We learn biblically the precedent for it so that we can better appreciate that, hey, this is more than just a little cup with a little wafer. <laughs> this ain't your morning snack. This is a meal of remembrance. Put your hands together. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise if you would. Come on, you can do better than that. Anybody remember what the Lord has done for you? Listen, we're prepared to close. We're prepared to close, but if there's a person here today who's saying, Reverend, <laughs> I want to be covered by that blood. I have yet to make a personal decision to accept Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. First, I want to speak to those who are online. If you're joining us online, we thank God for your presence. We honor you and we pray God's blessings on you wherever you are. There's a QR code that's popping up on the screen right now, and you can scan that QR code. Once you scan it, it's going to populate a link. Click that link, and there you can indicate your desire to know the Lord. People in the room are doing the same thing you're doing. If you're in the room, there should be a QR code on a seat nearby you. If you take out your smartphone, open up the camera, hover it over that code, a link will pop up. Indicate your desire to know the Lord and to join the Lord's church. 
and someone from EBC will follow up with you later this week to get you connected. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. Thank you. Y'all give God praise for our pastor as he comes. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. What an amazing message on today. Anybody feel like taking the Lord's Supper again? After hearing all of that, just let's just do it again. We, we can come tonight and we'll do it again. Son in whom I'm well pleased. Job well done. Job well done. Job well done. Job well done. You know, I guess that's when you start realizing you get a tad bit older. When you start getting excited about seeing the upcoming generation and knowing that that upcoming generation is prepared, equipped to take the baton. It's ironic. Lucy and I were just talking about that in the office earlier today. And so again, I'm just super excited to have witnessed Dr. Hall as, as, as a little boy. I can recall at the ML King location in Adamsville how Hall and a couple of other young boys at that time, no disrespect, would come to the office and to see him now with three boys of his own and to see the grace of God, the favor of God, the hand of God on his life. I remember him and his wife, Ebony, dating. And i never forget, you know, I was like, uh, I hear you. He said, Pastor, I'm going to marry her. And lo and behold, they said, I do. And they are a dynamic duo in ministry. And so I'm excited about what God is doing. And I shared this with him some years ago, years ago, as we started the Moti Sites. And I was al already able to sense and to see that the hand of God was on him in a unique way as it related to pastoring. And I shared with him, I said, Hall, oh, listen, here's my commitment. If you finish your D-man, your doctoral degree, I'll turn the Kanye's location over to you. And you can, listen to this, you can take lead with complete autonomy. And that particular location can become the location that you become senior pastor over. And so we're in the process right now of working that vision out. Working that vision out. That's right, working that vision. See, the reality is, pastor was asking me, you know, some time ago, based upon our multi-site model, well, how do you avoid a church split? It's easy. You don't have to split if you can share. And then you also identify a person who has the right spirit. Does that make sense? And so I'm excited that we're working throughout the balance of this year of releasing the Conyers location and Pastor Darrell Hall would take over full leadership of that location. And I'm excited about it. I'm excited. Now I'm always having to give this preference because when you hear that comment, then everyone starts thinking, well, we're doing it with all the locations. That's not the case. You know, uh, everyone is not at the same level. As a parent, you understand this truth. All of your kids are at different stages and level and you gotta, you can give someone too much too soon and it ends up hurting them. And then you can hold back someone who's ready and you end up reducing their capacity to grow. And so again, parenting takes a whole lot of discernment. You gotta sit there and discern now when they're ready and when they're not ready. And it's nothing to take away from a person to say, ah, oh, just not, just not now. That's not not never, just not now. A little bit more growth, a little bit more development, a little bit more coaching. And that's where that whole process of having elders around provide support. So again, super excited. Let's again give God praise and give God glory. So again, we're preparing to depart from this place and we give God praise for you. And uh, as we depart again, uh, stay mindful of our evening service. We'll certainly love for you to be present in the facility or watch online. Be a part of what God is doing in our lives. Also excited to see as we close another son of our, uh, uh, of our house, uh, Chief Cochran, who's with us, Dr. Cochran, who's with us. 
And as we know, he's between different locations and things of that sort, but super excited to see him. All right, family, let's uh, prepare to depart from this place. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he bless your down city and your uprising. Be blessed, my brother. Be blessed, my sister. In Jesus' name, be blessed. Amen. Amen.